Hello and welcome to the next edition of the HP Discover podcast series. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, your host and moderator for this ongoing sponsored discussion on big data innovation and how it's making an impact on people's lives. Once again, we're focusing on how companies are adapting to the new style of IT to gain deep insights and therefore deliver better user experiences as well as better overall business results. Our next innovation case study interview highlights how InfoScout in San Francisco gleans new levels of accurate insights into retail buyer behavior by collecting data directly from consumer sales receipts. In order to better analyze actual retail behaviors and patterns, InfoScout provides incentives for buyers to share their receipts. But InfoScout is then faced with the daunting task of managing and cleansing that essential data to provide actionable and understandable insights. To learn more about how big and even messy data can be harnessed for near real-term business analysis benefits, that's real-time business analysis benefits, please join me in welcoming our guests. We're here with Tibor Moses, a Senior Vice President of Data Engineering at InfoScout. Welcome, Tibor. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Glad you're with us. We're also joined today by Jared Schrieber, the co-founder and CEO there at InfoScout based in San Francisco. Welcome, Jared. Glad to be here. Jared, let's start with you. You know, we don't often get the option of choosing how the best data comes to us. Uh, in your business, you've been able to uniquely capture strong data, but you need to treat it a lot to use it. And you also need a lot of that data in order to get good trend analysis. So the payback is that you get far better information on essential buyer behaviors, but you need a, a lot of technology to accomplish that. So tell us about why you wanted to get to this specific kind of data and then your novel way of acquiring it, please. Now, I think a quick history lesson is in order. In market research industry, consumer purchase panels have been around for about 50 years, and they started with diaries in people's homes where they had to write down exactly every single product that they would buy day in, day out into this diary and mail it in once a month. About 20 years ago, with the advent of, uh, of modems in people's homes, uh, leading research firms like Nielsen would send a custom barcode scanner into people's homes and ask them to scan each product they bought, some in the regular price, the sales price, any coupons or deals that they got, and details about the overall shopping trip into this custom barcode scanner uh, and then transfer that electronically. And that approach has not changed in the last 20 years. And with the advent of smartphones and mobile apps, we saw a totally new way to capture this information from consumers that would revolutionize how and why somebody would be willing to share their purchase information with a market research company. Interesting. So what is it about the mobile that is so different from the past and why does that provide more quality data for your purposes? Yeah, there's two, two reasons in particular. The first is instead of having consumers scan the barcode of each and every item they purchase and thumb in the pricing details, we're able to simply have them snap a picture of their shopping receipt. So instead of spending 20 minutes after a grocery shopping trip scanning every item and thumbing in the details, it now takes 15 seconds to simply open the app, snap a picture of the shopping receipt, and be done. The second reason is why somebody would be willing to participate. Using smartphone apps, we can create different experiences for different kinds of people with different reward structures that will incentivize them uh, to do this activity. For example, our Shoparoo app is a next generation school fundraiser akin to Box Tops for Education. It allows people to shop anywhere, buy anything, just take a picture of their receipt and we'll make an instant donation to their school, kid's school every time. Another app is more of a Tamagotchi game called Receipt Hog, where if you download the app, you've adopted a virtual runt, you feed it pictures of your receipts, and it levels up into a fat and happy hog, earning coins in a piggy bank along the way that you can then cash out from at the end of the day. These kinds of experiences are a lot more intrinsically and extrinsically rewarding to the panelists and has allowed, has allowed us to grow a panel that's many times larger than the next largest panel ever seen in the world, uh, tracking consumer purchases on a day-in, day-out basis. Interestingly, now, what is it that um, you can get from these new input approaches and this incentivization through an app interface? Can you provide me some sort of uh, 
a measurement of uh, an improved or increased amount of um, participation rates. Uh, how has this worked out? Yeah, it's been it's been phenomenal. In fact, our panel is still growing leaps and bounds. Uh, we have 200,000 people sharing with us their purchases on a day in day out basis. Now, we capture 150,000 shopping trips a day. The next largest panel in the world captures just 10,000 shopping trips a day. In addition to the shopping trip data, we're, we're capturing geolocation information, Facebook likes and interests uh, from these people, demographic information. Uh, and more and more uh, associated with their with their mobile device and email accounts that are connected to it. Fascinating, sort of yet another unanticipated consequence of of the mobility trend that's so important uh, today. To Tibor, let's go to you. Uh, so the good news is that Jared has acquired this trove of information for you. Uh, the bad news is that now you have to make sense of it. It's coming in in some interesting ways uh, as as a almost a picture or an image. Uh, in some cases, and at a great volume. Uh, so you have velocity and you have variability and, and you have volume. So what does that mean for you as as the vice president of, of software, uh, you know, engineering and data engineering? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's right. So uh, obviously this growing uh, panel is creating a, a growing uh, volume of data that uh, has created a massive sort of uh, data pipeline challenge for us over the, over the years. And um, we had to engineer a data pipeline that is capable of processing this uh, incoming data as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, our data pipeline has went through uh, an evolution. So we started out with um, a simple solution at the beginning with MySQL, and then we evolved into uh, using uh, Elastic Mapper, use Pig and Hive. Um, but we felt that uh, we wanted to create a data pipeline that's much faster. We can bring data to our customers uh, much faster. And uh, that's how we arrived to Vertica. Uh, we looked at uh, different solutions and uh, found Vertica uh, as a very suitable product for us. And that's what we're using today. <clears throat> well, um, walk me through the process, uh, Tibor. How does this information come in? How do you gather it? Uh, where does the data go? I understand you're using the HP Vertica platform as a cloud solution in, in the uh, Amazon Web Services cloud. Walk me through the process for the data lifecycle, if you will. Sure, uh, absolutely. So uh, we use, as you mentioned, uh, AWS uh, for all of our uh, production infrastructure. Uh, our users, uh, as Jared mentioned, typically download uh, one of our uh, several apps and uh, after, their, uh, after they complete a uh, receipt scan uh, <clears throat> from their grocery uh, purchases, that receipt, the, the <clears throat> image of that receipt uh, is being uploaded to our backend infrastructure. Uh, we uh, uh, try to OCR that, uh, that image of the <clears throat> receipt. And in many cases, if we can't, then we use uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk to uh, try to uh, uh, make sense of the image and uh, try to uh, turn that, in, uh, that image into text. And at the end of the day, uh, when uh, an image is processed, we have a fairly clean version of that receipt in a text format. Uh, and in the next phase, we have to process the text and try to attribute uh, <coughs> uh, various items from that receipt that come from the text uh, and uh, make the data available on, uh, on our Vertica uh, data warehouse. Now, um, our, point, customers, yeah. our, our customers, our uh, customers then using a BI platform that uh, we built uh, specific for them to be able to analyze the data. And that the BI platform is connecting to Vertica so our customers can go in and sort of analyze various metrics uh, of, uh, of our users and their uh, shopping purchasing behavior. Right. Now, Jared, back to you. There's an awful lot of information on a receipt. Uh, it must must be very complex, given not just the date and the place, the type of retail organization, but all the different um, SKUs, all, every item that's possibly being bought. How, how do you attack that sort of a data problem from a, a schema and a cleansing and ETL and then making it, therefore, you, you know, useful? 
sure. It's actually a huge advantage for us at the end of the day, although it is quite complex because every retailer's receipt is different. The way that they structure the receipts, uh, the level of specificity about the items on the receipt, the, the existence of product codes, whether they are public product codes like the kind you see on a barcode for a for a soda product uh, versus an internal product code that they use as a, as a stock keeping unit internally versus just a short description on the receipt. And one of our challenges as a company is to figure out the, the algorithmic uh, methods that allow us to identify what each one of those codes and short descriptions actually represents in terms of a real world product or category uh, so that we can make sense of that data on behalf of our clients. And that's one of the real challenges uh, associated with taking this receipt-based approach and turning that into useful data for our clients on a daily basis. You know, I imagine this would be of interest to a lot of different types of information and data gathering that increasingly not only are pure data uh, formats and text formats being brought into the, the mix as has been the case for many years, but these, this image-based approach, the non-structured approach, um, you know, quickly, any lessons learned here in the retail space that you think will uh, extend to other industries? Are we going to be seeing more and more of this image-based approach to, to analysis gathering? Oh, I think we certainly are. I just take uh, Google Maps as an example in Google Street View, where they're they're driving around the cars and capturing uh, images of of house numbers and and building numbers, and then associating that to the actual map data. I think that's a very simple example. A lot of the techniques that we're trying to apply in terms of making sense of short descriptions for products on receipts are akin to those being used to understand and perform social media analytics. So that when somebody makes a tweet, you try and figure out what what is that tweet actually about and mean with those uh, abbreviated words and shortened character sets. Uh, it's very, very similar types of natural language processing uh, and regular expression algorithms that, that help us understand uh, what these short descriptions for products actually mean on a receipt. Interesting. So we've had some very substantial data complexity hurdles to overcome. <clears throat> now we've got also the, the basic blocking and tackling of data, transport, warehouse, processing, platform. Going back to Tibor, uh, once you've applied your algorithms, once you've sliced and diced this information and made it into something you can apply to a, a typical data uh, warehouse and, and BI environment, um, how did you overcome these issues about the volume, and the complexity, especially now that we're dealing with a cloud infrastructure? Yes, yeah, so um, one of the sort of benefits of Vertica uh, as we went into the discovery process was the extreme sort of compression algorithm that Vertica is using. So since we have a large volume of data to deal with uh, and build analytics from, uh, it's uh, turned out to be extremely beneficial for us that uh, Vertica is capable of compressing data extremely well. And as a result of that, um, um, some of our core queries that is powering a BI solution can be optimized uh, to run like super fast. So that would be one. Um, <clears throat> you also asked about the uh, you also asked about the cloud uh, solution and why we went into the cloud and what is the benefit of doing that. We really like uh, running our entire data pipeline in AWS because it's super easy to scale it up and down. It's very easy for us to build a new vertical cluster if you need to, uh, to evaluate something that's not in production yet. And if, if that idea doesn't work, then we can just pull it down. Um, uh, it's very easy for us to scale vertical up if we need to uh, on the cloud without you know, having to deal with any sort of contractual issues. So it's a very natural, uh, uh, it's a very natural place for us to keep a data pipeline. And to put this in context, we're capturing three times as much data every day now as we were six months ago. And then the wow. queries that we're running against us have probably gone up 50x to 100x in that time period as, as well. And so when we talk about need, needing to scale this up quickly, uh, I think that's a prime example as to why. Yeah, that's fascinating. What's happened in just this last six months that's required that that ramp up? Is it just because of the popularity of your model, the the... the impactfulness and effectiveness of the uh, mobile app acquisition model, or, or is there something else at work here? 
It's twofold. Our mobile apps have gotten more and more popular, and uh, we've had more and more consumers adopt them as a way to raise money for their kids' school or earn money for themselves in a gamified way by submitting pictures of the receipts. So that's driven massive growth in terms of the data we capture. Uh, but also, our client base has more than tripled in that time period as well. And so now, uh, the client demands of, of how to use and leverage this data as those increase and our abilities to deliver uh, against their business questions increase, the number of queries uh, that we're running against this data just keep, continues to multiply. Yeah, so that's, to me, a real proof point of this whole architectural approach. You've been able to grow uh, by a factor of three in your client base in six months, but you haven't gone back to them and say, you'll, you'll have to wait for six months while we put in a warehouse and test it and debug it. Uh, we're just, no, you've been able to just take that volume and ramp up. That's, uh, that's very impressive. Uh, and, and this is a, Tibor. Yeah. I was just going to say, this is a core differentiator for us in the, in the marketplace. The market research industry has to keep up with the pace of marketing, and that pace of marketing has shifted from months of lead time for TV and print advertising down to literally hours of lead time to be able to make a change to a digital ad advertising campaign or a social media campaign or a search engine campaign. And so the pace of marketing has changed. The pace of market research has to, has to keep, keep up. And so clients aren't willing to wait four weeks or even a week for a data update anymore. They want to know what happened yesterday, today, uh, in order to, to make changes on the fly. Right. Yeah, so we've spoken about your novel approach to acquiring this data. We've talked about the importance of having the right platform and the right cloud architecture to both handle the volume as well as scale to a dynamic, rapidly growing marketplace. Let's talk a little bit now about what you're able to then therefore do for your clients in terms of reports, of visualization, frequency, customization. What can you now do with this cloud-based Vertica engine and this incredibly valuable retail data in a near real-time environment for your clients? Yeah, so I think a few things on, on the, the client side. Traditional market research providers of panel data have to put up very tight guardrails in terms of how clients can access and run reports against the data. These, these queries are very complex. The, the numerators and denominators for every single record of the data are different and can be changed on the fly because if all of a sudden I want to look at anyone who shopped at Walmart in the last one, 12 months and has bought uh, cat food in the last month and did so at a store other than Walmart, and I want to see their purchase behavior and how they shop across multiple retailers and categories, and I want to do that on the fly, that gets really complex. And traditional kind of data warehousing and BI technologies don't support allowing people, general business analyst users, to be able to run those kinds of queries and reports on the fly, yet that's exactly what they want. They want to be able to answer ask those business questions to get answers, and that's been key to our strategy is to be able to allow them to do so um, uh, themselves as opposed to coming back to them and saying, you know what, that's going to be a pretty big project. It'll require a few of our engineers. We'll come back to you in a few weeks and see what we can do. Instead, we can hand them the tools directly uh, in a guided workflow to allow them to, to do that literally on the fly and have answers in minutes versus weeks. Hmm. Tibor, how does that translate into <clears throat> the platform underneath? Uh, if you're allowing for uh, a business analyst type of <clears throat> uh, skill set to come in and apply their tools rather than deep SQL queries or other more complex uh, querying tools, what is it that you need from your platform in order to accommodate that uh, type of report, that type of visualization and the ability to bring a larger set of, of individuals into this uh, analysis capability. Imagine that uh, our BI platform can, can um, throw out very complex ad hoc queries, uh, right? So our BI platform uh, essentially is using under the hood a query engine that is gonna run queries against Vertica. And because the, as Jared mentioned, the questions are so complex on the uh, uh, questions. So I would say that some of the queries that uh, we run against Vertica are very different than your typical like BI use case. They're very specialized and they're very specific. So um, one of the reasons why we went with Vertica is its ability to compute uh, very complex queries at, at, uh, at, at a very high speed. And 
we look at vertical not as a uh, not as simply a uh, SQL another SQL database that scales very well and that's very fast, but we also look at it as a, as a compute engine. So as part of our query engine, we running certain um, uh, queries and certain data transformations that would be super complicated to run outside vertical. We take advantage of the fact that you can run, uh, create and run custom UDFs that is not part of uh, NZ99 SQL. Um, we take advantage of some of the special functions that's built into vertical that is uh, allowing data uh, to be sessionized very easily. Jared can talk about the, some of the use cases where we like to analyze the user's uh, entire shopping trips. And imagine that in order to do that, we have to uh, 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 stitch together different uh, points in time that a user uh, has went through and shopped at various, uh, various uh, locations. And using uh, some of the building functions in Vertica that's not part of SQL, it's very easy for us to like look at shopping journeys. We call them trip circuits and analyze user behavior around those along the trip, for example. Tibor, what other ways can you be using and exploiting the Vertica capabilities uh, in the deliverables for your clients? Sure. So one of the major reasons why we decided to uh, go with Vertica is uh, its ability to optimize queries, very complex queries. So as I mentioned, a BI platform uh, is using a query engine under the hood that, uh, so if, if a user goes to a BI platform and uh, asks a very complicated business question, business question uh, our BI platform turns that question into a a very complicated query. These are very different from uh, your typical so like BI use case just because of our complexity of our data. And so one of the big benefits uh, for us to use Vertica to be able to then optimize these ad hoc queries on the fly. So it's very easy for, uh, to do this with Vertica, running the database optimizer to uh, build custom projections uh, on Vertica and uh, making uh, a lot of, sort of ad hoc queries um, running much faster than we could do before. Well, great. Um, you know, it's always, I think, more um, impactful for us to learn through an example rather than just hear you describe this. Do you have any specific uh, InfoScout retail clients that you can describe how they've leveraged your solution and how some of these both technical and uh, feature attributes uh, have benefited them. So uh, an example of, of someone using InfoScout and, and what it's done for them. Sure. We worked with a major retailer this holiday season to track what was happening on Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday for them in real time. And they wanted to understand their core shoppers versus kind of uh, less loyal shoppers versus non-core shoppers, how these people were shopping uh, across retailers on Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday so that they could try and respond in more real time to the dynamics happening in the marketplace and perform. And so, you know, if you look at what it takes to do that, for us to be able to get those receipts, process them, get them transcribed, get that data in, get it, the algorithms run to be able to map it to the brands and categories, and then to calculate all kinds of metrics, uh, the simplest ones being market share, the most complex ones, having to do with, as Tibor had mentioned, the shopper journey or the trip circuit, to understand that when this retailer was the, the shopper's first stop, what were they most likely to buy at that retailer? How much were they likely to spend? And how was that different than what they ended up buying uh, and spending at other retailers that followed? And how did that contrast to situations where that retailer was the second stop or the last stop of the day in that, in that uh, um, shopping day that is Black Friday. And so for them to be able to understand that of where they were winning and losing among what kinds of shoppers who were looking for what kinds of products and deals um, was an immense advantage to them, uh, the likes of which they'd never had, be had before. Right, now this must be a very um, sizable um, decision point for them, right? This is going to help you decide where to build new uh, retail outlets, for example, or how to uh, structure the, uh, the experience of the uh, consumer walking through that particular uh, bricks and mortar environment. <clears throat> so when, when we bring this sort of analysis to bear, this isn't uh, refining, uh, you know, 
at a modest level, what's going to be a business benefit. This could be a major benefit to them in terms of how they strategize and grow. This could be, you know, something that really deeply impacts their bottom line. Is that not the case? It has implications to to what kinds of categories they feature in their in their television and display advertising campaigns and their circulars. It can influence how much space they give in their store to each one of the departments. It impacts their pricing strategies. Uh, it has enormous strategic implications, not just tactical day-to-day uh, pricing decisions, if you will. Right. All right. Now, that was a retail example. I understand you also have clients that are interested in seeing how a brand uh, works across a variety of, of outlets or channels. So is there another example you can provide on somebody who is looking to understand better a, a brand impact at a, at a wider um, level across uh, a geography, for example? Yeah. So I'll give you another example as it relates to this. Um, a retailer and a brand were working together to understand why the brand sales were down at this particular retailer during the summer summertime. And to make it uh, clearer for you, this is a brand of ice cream. So in ice cream, uh, sales should go up during the summer, during the, the warmer months. And the retailer couldn't understand why, why their sales were underperforming for this brand um, during the summer months. And so uh, to to be able to figure this out, we had to piece together, again, along the shopper journey, over time periods, um, not only in the weeks during the summer months, but, but year round, to understand this, this dynamic of how they were shopping. And at the end of the day, what we were able to help this client quickly discover was that um, during the summer months, people eat more ice cream. If they eat more ice cream, they're going to want larger pack sizes when they go and buy that ice cream. This particular retailer tended to carry smaller pack sizes. So when the summer months came around, even though people had been buying their ice cream at this retailer in the winter and spring, they now wanted larger pack sizes and they were finding them at other retailers and switching their spend over to these other retailers. And so for the brand, the opportunity was a selling story to the retailer to give them more freezer space and and carry additional assortment of products uh, to help drive greater sales for that brand, but also to help the retailer grow their category sales as well. Fascinating. So just that insight could really help them figure that out. They probably wouldn't have been able to do it any other way. Okay, we've seen some examples of how impactful this can be, how how much a business can benefit from it. Uh, But let's go back to the idea of the architecture. For me, one of my favorite truths in IT is that architecture is destiny. And that seems to be the case with you all using the combination of AWS and HP Vertica. Uh, it seems to me that you don't have to suffer the costs of a large capital outlay of having your own data center and facilities that you're able to acquire these very advanced capabilities at a price point that is uh, significantly less from a capital outlay and perhaps predictable and adjustable to the demand. Um, Is that something you then can pass along? Tell me a little bit about the economics of how this architectural approach works for you. Sure. So one of the benefits of using uh, AWS is that it's very easy for us to adjust uh, our infrastructure on demand uh, as we see fit. So we, as Jared referred to, um, uh, referred to uh, some of the examples that we had before, we we did major analysis for a large retailer during um, Thanksgiving uh, around Black Friday and we had some special promotions going on at that at that point. So imagine that our data volume would grow tremendously uh, from one day to the next like couple of days. And then after when the promotion was over and uh, obviously the big shopping season is over, then our volume would come down uh, come down somewhat. Uh, when you run an infrastructure in a cloud uh, in combination with um, underlying data storage and data engine that is very easy to scale up and down. <clears throat> it's very efficient or very cost efficient for uh, to, to run an operation where you can just uh, add the additional computing power as you need. And then when you don't need it anymore, you can like scale it down. We did this during that, that uh, time period when we had to bring so much fresh data out to a client so quickly that uh, we could just double the size of our vertical cluster. We could just add additional notes and we, we, we see closely 
uh, uh, very close to linear scalability by improving our, our, our cluster size. <clears throat> On the business side, the other advantage is we can manage our, our cash flows quite nicely. So if you think about running a startup, cash is king, and not having to do large capital outlays uh, in advance, but being able to, to adjust up and down with the, the fluctuations in our business is, is also valuable. Well, great. <clears throat> okay, um, we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, I wonder, though, if you have any other insights into – uh, the business benefits from an analytics perspective of doing it this way. Uh, that is to say, uh, incentivizing consumers, getting better data, being able to move that data and then analyze it uh, at an on-demand uh, infrastructure basis and then deliver queries in whole new ways to a wider audience within your client base. Um, I guess I'm looking for a little bit of, of how this stacks up both to the competitive landscape, but also to the past. How how new and how innovative is this in marketing? And then we'll talk about where we go next. But let's let's try to get a level set as to how new and how refreshing this is given what the technology enables, both that cloud basis and the and the mobility basis and then of course the the underlying uh, analytics platform basis. Sure. I think an uh, example that's going on right now, and that's around a major new new product launch for a, for a very large consumer goods company, and they chose us to help monitor this launch because they were tired of waiting for six months for any insights in terms of who was buying it, what, how they were discovering it, what uh, how they came about choosing it over the competition, how their experience was uh, with the product, and what it meant for their business. And so they chose to work with us for this major new brand launch because we could offer them visibility within days or weeks of launching that new product in the market to help them understand who were the people who were buying. Was it the target audience that they thought it, thought it was going to be? Um, or was it a different demographic or, or lifestyle profile than they were expecting? Because if so, they might need to change their positioning or, or marketing tactics and targeting accordingly. How are these people discovering the product? We're able to trigger surveys to them in the moment, uh, right after they've made that purchase, and then flow that data back through to our clients to help them understand how are these people discovering it? Was it a TV advertisement? Did they discover it on the shelf, on the display in the store? Did a friend tell them about it? Was their social media marketing campaign working? Um, and then we're also able to, to figure out what these people were buying before. Were they new to this category of product? Did they not use this kind of product before and they were just giving it a try? Were they buying uh, a, a different brand and, and have now switched over from that competitor? And if so, how did they like it by comparison? And will they repeat purchase? Is this brand going to be successful? Is it meeting needs? These are enormous decisions, uh, often hundreds of millions of dollars spent by major consumer, com consumer goods companies on new brand launches. And to get this quick feedback in terms of what's working and what's not, who to target with what kind of messaging and what it's doing to the marketplace in terms of, of um, stealing share from competitors, driving new people to the product category can influence major investment decisions along the lines of, do we need to build a new manufacturing facility? Do we need to change our marketing campaign? Should we go ahead and invest in that TV Super Bowl ad because this really has a chance to go big? These are massive decisions that these companies can now make in a timely manner based on um, this new approach to capturing and making use of the data. Instead of waiting six months for a read on a new product launch, they're now waiting just weeks and able to make the same kinds of decisions as a result. So in a word, it's uh, unprecedented. You really just haven't been able to do this before. It's not been possible before at all, and I think that's really what's fueling the growth in our business. Right. Okay, let's look to the future quickly. Um, we hear a lot about the Internet of Things. We know that mobile is only uh, partially through its evolution. We're going to see more smartphones and more hands doing more types of transactions around the globe. <clears throat> People will be using their phones for more of what we have thought of as traditional uh, business and commerce. So that opens up a lot more information that's generated, therefore need to gather and then analyze. So where do we go next? Um, how does this um, generate uh, additional novel capabilities? And then where do we go perhaps in terms of verticals? We haven't even talked about food or groceries, uh, hospitality, even healthcare. So um, 
without going too far afield, because this could be another hour conversation in itself, uh, maybe we could just uh, tease the, the listener and the reader uh, with where um, the potential for this uh, going forward is, and I'll open it up to both of you. Sure. So if you think about Internet of Things as it relates to our business, there are a couple of exciting developments. One is the use of, of things like beacons inside of stores, so that now we can know exactly which aisle people have walked down and what shelf they've stood in front of and what products they've interacted with uh, because that beacon is communicating with their smartphone and that smartphone is tied to our, to our user account in the way uh, by which we are surveying these individuals or triggering surveys to them in the moment as they shop. That's not something that's been doable before. It's something that the Internet of Things and very specifically beacons tied to linking with smartphones will allow us to do going forward. It, um, and I think that'll open up entirely new fields of research and consumer understanding about how people shop and make decisions uh, at the shelf. I think the same is true inside the home. If we talk about the Internet of Things as it relates to smart refrigerators or smart laundry machines, et cetera, understanding uh, daily lifestyle activities and how people make choice of which products to use and how to use them inside their home is a field of research that is underserved today that I think the Internet of Things is really going to open up in the years to come. Fascinating. And then just quickly, uh, other uh, retail sectors or vertical industries where this would make a great deal of sense. Well, I've got a friend who, who runs uh, an amazing business called Wavemark, which uh, is basically an Internet of Things for medical devices and, and medical consumables inside of hospitals and care facilities, and the ability to track in real time uh, inventory, tying it to patients and procedures, tying it back to, to billing and consumption, and making all of that data back available to the medical device manufacturers so that they can understand how and when their products are being used in the real world, in practice, is revolutionizing that industry. And so uh, we're yeah. seeing it in, in healthcare, and I think we're going to see it across every industry. Right. All right, last word to you, Tibor. Uh, <clears throat> given what Jared just told us about mm, the greater applicability, <clears throat> <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> the, um, the model, the architecture uh, comes back to mind for me. Uh, the cloud, the mobile device, the data, the engine, the ability to deal with that velocity, volume, and variability at a cost point that is uh, doable and, and, and scales up and down. Um, thoughts about this from an engineering perspective and, and where we go next? Sure. Uh, we see that <clears throat> with all these new opportunities coming up, bubbling up, um, our data, the amount of data that we have to process on a daily basis is just going to continue to grow at an exponential level, uh, at an exponential rate. And uh, we continue to uh, get additional information uh, on <clears throat> shopping behavior from external data sources. So we see that our data pipeline is just going to grow. So obviously, we uh, try to engineer everything um, in a way that our uh, infrastructure will be uh, continue to be as scalable as possible, and as our business uh, requires to expand this infrastructure, we be, we should be able to do that. Very good. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. We've been learning about how InfoScout in San Francisco gleans new levels of accurate insights into consumer behavior by collecting data directly from sales receipts. And in order to better analyze that data and use it, we've seen how they've used a uh, architecture based on the AWS public cloud, the infrastructure as a service and data as a service capabilities, but built on HP Vertica as the engine for analytics and for delivery of the analysis. So InfoScout is faced with the daunting task of managing and cleansing this data, and they've been able to scale very impressively over the past six months using Vertica in the cloud. So to learn more, uh, we've uh, been here with uh, our two guests, and I'd really like to thank them Tibor Moses, he's the Senior Vice President of Data Engineering at InfoScout. Thank you so much, Tibor. Thank you. And also Jared Schrieber, the co-founder and CEO there at InfoScout. Thank you so much, Jared. It's a pleasure, Dana. Thank you. And a big thank you as well to our audience for joining us for this special new style of big data discussion. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at InterArbor Solutions, your host for this ongoing series of HP-sponsored discussions. Thanks again for joining, and don't forget to come back next time.